Today's story will make you think twice before buying a lottery ticket, because sometimes money can be a curse. Chapter 1. Illiterate People looked down on Abraham. After all, he was illiterate, having dropped out of school in the seventh grade. Not being able to read or write leaves you with a stark choice. You can either hide your impediment and accept the consequences when things inevitably go wrong, or you can tell the truth and face the humiliation that comes with it. Abraham worked odd jobs. That way, he didn't need to make either decision. After all, nobody cares whether you can read or write when you're sweeping floors or moving furniture. To him, it was the contents of one's character that really mattered. Nevertheless, he would often take long walks in the wealthy neighborhoods of Polk County, dreaming of a better life for him and his young son. The law of attraction is a powerful thing. With enough belief, you can manifest almost anything into existence. Abraham was on the precipice of wealth beyond his imagination, something he would soon come to regret. Chapter 2. Lucky If you were down to your last five bucks, would you go buy a lottery ticket? Abraham had a strange feeling, so trusting his instincts, he purchased a couple of lottery tickets. It was a decision that would irrevocably change his life. When you win the lottery, they give you a choice. You can either take a lump sum or spread your winnings over decades. If Abraham had been educated, he might have hired a tax advisor and made some smart investments. Instead, he took the full amount, $30 million. If you'd asked Abraham how many zeros that added up to, he wouldn't have been able to tell you. It all went straight into his checking account. There was now seemingly no stopping him from achieving his dreams. But just three years later, Abraham would be dead. Chapter 3. Popular After winning millions of dollars, Abraham was suddenly the person everybody wanted to know. First, of course, there were the ladies. Abraham was a ladies' man. It didn't matter if they preferred the company of his wallet, so long as he got to enjoy the perks, too. Soon, other folks began to turn up at his door. There were nephews, second cousins, even old school friends, people he hadn't spoken to in years. Everybody has a sob story when it comes to money. There were unpaid medical bills, impending home repossessions, businesses that just needed an infusion of cash. Abraham understood this all too well, having shared the same plight just weeks before. He was happy to help out. For a time, it seemed that almost anyone could visit his house and leave with a check for $100,000. But good things never last forever. Eventually, Abraham was down to his last million, with people who'd borrowed from him no longer returning his phone calls. Chapter 4. Carjacking Dee Dee Moore once claimed to have been carjacked at gunpoint by a trio of Hispanic men. It turned into an ordeal that lasted hours. Once each of them was done taking turns with her, they sped away, discarding her in a nearby ditch. Her story seemed far-fetched. Dee Dee was good at making up bizarre lies. That was her gift. The police later determined that she tied herself up and then purposefully leapt from a fast-moving vehicle. You see, it had to look good. After all, the insurance company wouldn't pay off her car loan without some colorful bruises to put in their report. It was one of the few times her lies had been caught. So when she approached Abraham, offering to write his biography, she knew exactly how to sell her proposal. From that point onward, Abraham didn't stand a chance. Chapter 5. Money Manager After giving away millions of dollars in lottery winnings, Abraham was starting to realize that he wasn't good with money. Dee Dee Moore was the only person helping him out of his mistake. She'd been able to recover some of the loans he'd made, improving his financial situation. Despite this, he still wasn't able to make the mortgage payments on his mansion. Dee Dee suggested he transfer all his assets into her company, ensuring that his finances were properly managed going forward. It made sense. Abraham, being illiterate, was in no position to manage a multi-million dollar lottery windfall. He gratefully signed over his fortune, confident that it was now in more capable hands. Dee Dee smiled gleefully, agreeing that she was indeed far more capable. 
Chapter 6. Vanished. When a lottery winner goes missing, people notice. Abraham was sick of being asked for money. His phone would ring incessantly with new requests. So, when he vanished, Dee Dee Moore was easily able to explain his absence. But, people never disappear completely, or at least those still counted amongst the living. There are always phone calls to family, photos from distant places, echoes of a new life. Since taking over Abraham's estate, Dee Dee had upgraded her lifestyle, enjoying luxury cars and exotic holidays. Elizabeth, Abraham's mother, was concerned that her son had stopped calling. She'd begun receiving a series of text messages, which would have been reassuring if it wasn't for her son's chronic illiteracy. Suspicions were inevitable. If Dee Dee had any sense, she would have fled immediately. But the best liars find a way to believe in their own lies. So, when approached by the police, Dee Dee offered to help them in any way possible. Chapter 7, Dark Imagination. Dee Dee Moore had tried covering the holes in her story with even more lies. Abraham had fled to avoid paying child support. Abraham had been dying of AIDS. Abraham was hiding from authorities after being involved with an underage girl. There were so many different stories, one for each of Dee Dee's moods. But none of the lies stuck. The police deal with liars every day. They were harder to fool. In desperation, she had even offered to sleep with one of the investigators, an approach which had backfired terribly. It seemed hopeless. What Dee Dee really needed was a scapegoat, someone to take the fall on her behalf. First she blamed a drug dealer, then a crooked lawyer, and finally, even her own 12-year-old son. The police were having none of it. They would need a signed confession. That's what it would take for Dee Dee to escape a murder charge now. Chapter 8. Scapegoat Dee Dee Moore was optimistic about her newly discovered scapegoat. Mike was about to surrender himself to the police over a serious drug charge. Convicts understand that prisoners can serve two entirely different types of prison time. Time with commissary and time without. Mike was prepared to take responsibility for Abraham's murder in return for $50,000. If he was going down, in his estimation for the remainder of his life. At least he would do it with an unlimited supply of Hershey bars and Cheetos. But his confession would need to be convincing. He would need the murder weapon and the location of Abraham's body. Dee Dee handed over a 38 Smith and Weston and then pointed to a newly poured concrete pad on her property. Abraham, whatever was left of him, was under there. Mike suggested they move Abraham's body but that wasn't enough for Dee Dee. She preferred to toss it into a cattle trough and then burn it with kerosene, even joking about bringing marshmallows. Certainly she wouldn't have been laughing had she known that Mike was in fact an undercover cop. Chapter nine, Tantrum. There's a right way and a wrong way to act in a courtroom, especially when you're being accused of murder. Dee Dee had told so many lies to police that her mind had become a maze of contradictions. In the process, she had convinced herself of her innocence. It was excruciating listening to the police systematically dismantle the hundreds of lies she had told them. She felt like her hollow soul was being turned inside out for everyone to see. Dee Dee shouted, she cried, she shook her head. There were no limits to her misbehavior in the courtroom. At one point, the judge threatened to remove her. It emerged that Dee Dee had shot Abraham twice in the chest after he had confronted her about the whereabouts of his money. Just as she was able to convince herself of her many other lies, she had equally became convinced that Abraham's lottery money was in fact hers. The judge disagreed, sentencing her to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That's it for today's true crime case. If you enjoyed it, stab the subscribe button in the face and sell what's left of the like button in burritos. After all, we can't have any witnesses, can we? See you next time, unless, of course, darkness finds you.